Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Hydrology and Water Quality of Prairie and Agricultural Streams with Dale Blevins. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, Carol will come on and read those out to Dale. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation. Uh, so to introduce today's speaker, Dale Blevins is a retired hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and a past president of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Dale continues to serve on the MPF Board of Directors and keeps busy managing family farmland and prairie plantings. So without further ado, take it away, Dale. Okay, well, thank you, Brooke. Um, as, as I just told you, I did work for the U.S. Geological Survey for about 30 years in the Water Resources uh, Program. And this, what I'm going to talk about today, is a study that we did. It's one of the last studies we did before I retired. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the results of that today. And it basically, it was a comparison of the water quality and the hydrologic characteristics of a couple of prairie streams versus some agricultural streams. Uh, the, the extent of prairie, you may have seen several maps like this in the past, I don't know, but the extent of prairie in the past was, as you can see, uh, a great portion of the middle part of the uh, United States. And the blue portion there on the right is the tall grass part. Um, and there was over 170 million acres of that at one time, but less than 4% of that remains and less than a half a percent in Missouri, Missouri's prairie remains. So there's uh, very little of the prairie. And what that means is that prairie streams are almost extinct in Missouri. In fact, there's really only one watershed uh, in the whole state that's over 90% prairie, and it's only about three square miles in area, and that's down at Prairie State Park which is one of the sites that we uh, included in this study. Um, so what some of the questions that we had were, in what ways has the conversion of prairie to agriculture changed our streams? Um, and how these differences may help explain the changes in the aquatic communities that have adapted to the, that were, that were adapted to former conditions. And then what differences might we expect if we could do prairie restorations in some of our watersheds? The study objectives, we, wanted, we did want to compare, uh, or does uh, agriculture change the hydro hydrologic and water quality character of prairie streams in Missouri and Eastern Kansas, Western Missouri and Eastern Kansas, characterize and compare the hydrology of the native prairie streams uh, with agricultural streams of similar size. And we wanted to compare and characterize the water quality of a native prairie stream with, sim with similar sized water agricultural streams. We really had, there really was no data until we did the study on a, a prairie a, a prairie stream in, in Missouri. So we, this is a data set that's kind of a first of its kind for our state. This is the, uh, uh, this diagram kind of shows the tall grass prairie hydrologic cycle. It's the same hydrologic cycle, it's just put in a prairie context. Um, I apologize for the small words here, but I'm just kind of going to go over a few of the things that we expected to, to have become important in a, spur, in a prairie watershed. So precipitation, we expect that to be pretty much the same over the agriculture and uh, prairie watersheds. We do expect surface runoff, we would have expected that perhaps to be a lot less, and we would have expected infiltration to be a lot more. And that infiltration can go a couple different ways. It can go into uh, Interflow, which is over here, that's uh, precipitation that goes in the soil and then is quickly returned to the stream through the soil. For, and then some of it can go deeper into groundwater and it can still return to the stream um, as a drain on the, uh, on the aquifer. So we expected the infiltration and the uh, seepage into the stream to be much bigger and surface runoff to be much less. We also expected things like sediment and nutrients to be much less. But that we collected this data to kind of verify or to examine those hypotheses. We had two prairie study sites. One is called East Drywood Creek at Prairie State Parks down by Lamar, Missouri. 
Uh, we had seven years of stream flow data, which mainly means we collected every five minutes. We had uh, uh, a data point for the height, the stage of the stream, that is the height of the water at the gauge. And then we also had the amount of flow in cubic feet per second every five minutes at the gauge. We also had water quality data for about 15 years. Most of those were, were monthly samples. Since we had it over 15 years, we had samples taken at low flow and at high flow and, and all ranges of the flow. The other prairie site is in the Flint Hills of Kansas. It's Kings Creek near Manhattan. It's four square miles, so it's slightly bigger, but not much. Uh, it is uh, where we had much longer stream flow record. And so you'll see that some of the some of the times that we can only compare with Kings Creek, we didn't have enough data to compare with Brywood for some things. And then uh, the water quality data uh, is 20 plus years. So we even have more water quality data there at the uh, Flint Hill site. It occurred to me that uh, it's been long enough now, 2009, since we last collected data, that in another 13 years, we would have plenty of data now to do some of these hydrologic analyses. So it'd be nice to revisit this study. The ideal approach would be if you had two watersheds right side by side, this is called a paired basin approach. They had same size, they had uh, the same precipitation, they, uh, everything pretty much was the same, same soils. Uh, the only thing that would have been different would have been the, the land cover. One would be prairie and one would be agriculture. Now we didn't have that opportunity to do that. So we had to um, uh, select sites that already were had data, were of a similar size and were either agricultural or prairie. And this map shows the sites that we had to compare with. The triangles were the stream flow gauges that we had uh, concurrent data with. And the two prairie sites there, East Drywood Creek and Kings Creek, have the big rectangles around them. Uh, we had to have uh, sites that had the same concurrent record uh, of flow, stream flow data. And then the yellow circles are uh, sites that had concurrent uh, water sampling and agricultural sites. So um, uh, those we had the two prairie sites, and then you can see the other sites that we were using to, uh, for agricultural sites to compare with. Okay. So uh, for the hydro hydro hydrology. Hydrologic comparisons, why we did a few things. We did hydrograph separations, which I'll show you in a minute. We looked at stream flow yield. And then we had some different flow characteristics we call ecological flow characteristics. Those are characteristics of the stream flow that, that basically control, guide, and uh, have a strong effects on the, on the ecology of the stream. So uh, there are certain characteristics of stream flows that control those things. So we'll look at those. Then the water quality measurements uh, comparisons, mostly we're looking at, at nutrients and pesticides and, and some field measurements. That means things that you measure actually when you're on the site, like dissolved oxygen or temperature or something like that. Okay, so one of the first things for the hydrologic results we looked at was something called spring flow yield. And it's just simply the amount from on a given rainstorm, the percentage of the rainfall that it exits the watershed as spring flow. So in a parking lot would be an example of where almost everything runs off. So your stream flow yield would be close to one. Whereas a peat bog, almost nothing runs off. So it would have a stream flow yield of zero. And so here's our comparison. Um, this, uh, the yield, so we would expect, you know, prairies since they are so they're covered with uh, dense this covered with plants and we have lots of roots and lots of duff and lots of things to slow down rainfall or runoff. We would expect uh, that the yields would be lower on prairie and indeed they are. In fact, our highest uh, East Fork, East Drywood Creek uh, is the, uh, was lower than the lowest uh, agricultural watershed for runoff yield, which is what we would expect. So there's some pretty significant decreases in the amount of runoff that escapes the watershed. Okay. Um, 
And then one of the ecological flow characteristics that we wanted to that, uh, we wanted to look at to make a big difference on the biota that live in the stream is called the uh, rise rate. That's just how fast a stream rises after a rainfall. Um, and you can see that Kings Creek is very slow to rise after a rainstorm uh, compared to the agricultural uh, sites that we had looked at in comparison. We didn't really have enough data uh, on dry, East Drywood Creek to compare, but uh, it's, a, it's a very stark comparison there. So it has a much slower rise rate, which is uh, actually good for most of the biota. Okay, this uh, look at the maximum flows. So uh, on the left is the median discharge in cubic feet per second. That's the, the flow. And uh, we have Kings Creek on the left is our prairie stream and our agricultural sites on the right there. And you can see that the one day maximum flow for the period of concurrent period of record we have, Kings Creek peak flows were much less, the one day maximum were much less than those agricultural sites. Maybe I'm just looking here, 12 compared with 40 um, for a, a maximum maximum flow. So that's you know a third or a fourth of the amount of maximum flow on a prairie stream is, is on the uh, agricultural streams. So the hydrograph separation is another technique we use. A hydrograph is just simply a graph of flow or discharge in cubic feet per second versus time. So we've got on the we've got flow over here and we got time on the bottom. And this top line is the hydrograph itself. It's the way that the hydrograph would look uh, as we pull it uh, off the, out of the field. It would um, uh, is as you can see here, after a rainstorm, it goes up and then it quits raining and then it's slow, it comes down slower, usually on the backside. We can divide that hydrograph up, though, into two different sources of water. The one here that is called quick flow is basically the runoff that runs directly off the surface. Rainfall falls on the surface and directly, directly to the stream, and that's what this quick flow is. Base flow tends to be routed through the soil or through an aquifer or through deeper in the ground and then returns to the stream, but it takes a much longer time to get there. So that's uh, what we were doing is, is how much of the hydrograph is runoff versus how much is base flow. And base flow is a term I'm probably gonna use uh, quite a bit uh, from here on. So the hydrographic separation at Kings Creek, it is almost all um, uh, base flow. Like 60 some percent, I guess, not quite all, but it's very high compared to the agricultural streams whose base flow is um, a lot less. So a lot of the water that comes out of the agricultural water sheds is coming out of uh, just directly off the surface. Um, whereas in the prairie water sheds, it's being routed through the soil or through uh, deeper into the ground before it gets to the stream. Okay, so the low flow duration, um, medium annual extreme low flow duration in days. So this is like um, when you have, uh, not during a runoff event, but just flow that's being sustained from uh, groundwater or from soil drainage. So we have, and this will be in the, you know, in the low flow periods, we have longer periods of those in the prairie in the Flint Hills here than we do on the agricultural watersheds, which are, those streams are not sustained very well at all by base. Now, you're gonna see in a little bit, this is, it's a little bit confusing because even though it's, the base flows are sustained more by prairie, there's gonna be more zero flow days in a prairie stream than there is in the uh, agricultural watersheds. And that's what this graph is. This is called a flow duration curve. On the left is discharge again, our flow. And it's an exponential graph, as you can see here, goes an order of magnitude each jump. And then across the bottom is just the percent of time that a given discharge is exceeded. 
And these two lines right here, this blue one and this red one, these are the two prairie streams. And the rest of them are all those um, agricultural streams. And what this says is that about 50% of the time, the prairie streams are not flowing. There may be pools, they may not be bone dry, but they're not flowing. And um, whereas uh, agricultural streams do not go uh, dry as often. And that's, that's a little bit hard to grasp, but basically I think what the explanation is, is number one, um, our prairie streams are not providing I'll first going back, I want to say one thing back up a little bit. A lot of these time, the period of time when these prairie streams are not flowing is between like July and October. And it takes a heck of a rain during that period of time to get to for the stream to even see a response. There was one time where we had a two and a half inch rain in that period of time down at Prairie State Park and we got no flow. It all infiltrated. Um, we other times there are even bigger storms and it would be almost no response. So, whereas the agricultural streams, they would see a response and they would uh, pick up their flows again. So part of that is just due to the amount, extreme amount of infiltration. The other thing it's due to is, is the prairies apparently are very effective at transpiring information, uh, transpiring moisture out of the soil. They take it out of the soil and put it back in the air before it can even get to the stream in that time of year. And, you know, that, July to October period. So uh, I think those are the primary reasons that we had that kind of conflicting story there. And I've already talked about this. The other thing that prairies have, macropores and preferential flow paths in the soil. So the soil cracks during dry periods of time. Also these roots on these very deep rooted plants provide preferential flow paths for the for, uh, rain that's on the surface of the prairie to infiltrate into the soil. There's also a mulch layer that slows it down from flowing on the surface. Okay, uh, I'm gonna switch into water quality now. And I gotta catch up on my notes. So dissolved oxygen, that is a very important uh, biologic um, parameter for critters that live in our prairie streams. And uh, these are all gonna be, you're gonna see a lot of box plots coming up. So let me explain to you what we're seeing here. The box plot, uh, that line in the middle, that yellow, that white line in the middle is the median of all 26 measurements that we made of dissolved oxygen is right here. So that's about 10 milligrams per liter. Once again, this is an exponential scale. Then the yellow box marks the 25 and 75 percentile. So 50% of the 26 measurements were between uh, the top and bottom of this box between about 11 and 8 milligrams per liter. And then the whiskers, that's these two bars right here, right here, that's uh, 10 and 90 percent percentiles. So 80 percent of the samples fell between those whiskers. And then these purple dots represent all the samples, all the measurements we made that fell outside that 10 and 90 percentile range. And you can see then on here that we did have a few very low measurements um, at East Drywood Creek um, uh, during while we were the, while we were sampling. Some of them were down here around looks like three milligrams per liter or less. Um, although in Kings Creek, the prairie in Kansas did not have did not go below this line here, which is the um, biologic standard that the state has set five milligrams per liter um, as the standard. Uh, but, you know, our agricultural streams certainly had a, their share of low dissolved oxygen values too. Uh, but I don't know that there's a big distinction there between dissolved oxygen and the prairie, between the prairie streams and the agricultural streams. Uh, a lot of that may be controlled by things like temperature and, uh, and the amount of algae in the water. Okay, this is fecal coliform. So in bacteria, fecal coliform are an indicator of bacteria uh, in the stream. 
Oh, I say, whoops. Yeah, I say, um, uh, you can see that there's less bacteria in the two prairie streams by quite a bit. Once again, that's an exponential scale over there on the left. So, you know, that's uh, quite a difference between the agricultural streams and the prairie streams. The, both prairie streams uh, were accessed by buffalo. Uh, I don't know, when, you know how that density might compare to the agricultural streams that could be accessed by cattle. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we have a lot less bacteria. A lot of that was probably a lot of that was due because we have less sediment in the prairie streams, uh, and bacteria tend to be attached to sediment. So if you have less sediment, you usually have less bacteria. Two two hundred is the state standard. There you can see um, that line going across. My pointer. Oh, there it is. There's the line of two hundred, which is the state standard. So the prairie streams are generally below that. Agricultural streams are generally above it. So that's another thing we can improve with, with prairie uh, plantings and prairie on watersheds. Total nitrogen. Um, uh, this is in base flow. So this is in the lower flows, not in runoff, just in the lower flows. And total nitrogen includes both dissolved nitrogen and uh, nitrogen that's attached to the sediment. It's total nitrogen is all of that together. And uh, the ecoregion, the, the standard that EPA set for total nitrogen in this uh, sub eco region is uh, set there right below one uh, milligram per liter. Uh, you know, the Kings Creek is definitely less. Um, East Drywood Creek is not that much less than the agricultural watersheds. You know, we might not expect total nitrogen to be a lot less in a prairie watershed because prairie watershed is full of organic material on the surface and it, is, it has a lot of nitrogen in it. So a lot of particulate matter that might get from those prairie plants get into the stream and can affect uh, increased total nitrogen. And a lot of that nitrogen that's in those plants is not all that terrible because it's not always readily available to the stream uh, biota and stream algae. Okay. Now in runoff, it's a different situation. Uh, runoff, we usually expect a lot more sediment. That's runoff from a stream, I mean from a storm. Um, so we expect a lot more sediment in a storm runoff situation, and generally we'll get uh, a lot of a lot more particulate nitrogen in that way. But um, the prairies are quite a bit less than the two agricultural streams that we had total nitrogen data on, uh, significantly because once again that's a an exponential scale. So, uh, you know, it's almost double in the agricultural watersheds compared to Kings Creek. Even though we have all this uh, vegetative material in the prairie watersheds. Okay, this is nitrite, nitrate, mostly nitrate in runoff. Nitrate is the part of the nitrogen of that total nitrogen is dissolved in this in the water so it's not particulate but it's dissolved and it's also the part of nitrogen that is most readily available to algae and biota in the stream um, it is like fertilizer to them and uh, it is also the uh, part of nitrogen that is most contributes to uh, the hypoxia in the gulf and hypoxia in the oceans uh, in general um, and you can see the drastic decrease in the amount of nitrate that comes out of the prairie stream, uh, just a few hundredths of a milligram per liter compared to agricultural streams that are uh, up around a one milligram per liter. Um, and so we can expect some drastic decreases in our nitrate uh, load. And consequently, if we had enough prairie watershed, we could expect a big decrease our hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. Phosphorus, in, uh, phosphorus is usually the limiting nutrient in the impoundments in Missouri. It's what uh, it's the it's the nutrient that algae are the most short of in the impoundments. 
And when it gets a shot of phosphorus, then the algae tends to go crazy and will um, get a big algal bloom and then can then it'll die and knock out all the oxygen out of the water. So phosphorus is, is an important nutrient. And we can look at uh, the total phosphorus, which once again is the amount of phosphorus that's both dissolved and on the sediment, on particulate matter. And uh, it is much less coming off a of prairie and off our of agricultural watershed. And that's part, a lot of that's because there's much less sediment coming off the prairie. Uh, so we can once again improve our lakes and, our, and our streams, and protect them from very harmful algal blooms by you know, having more prairie in our watershed. This is the total phosphorus and base flow. Uh, you wouldn't expect as high numbers because you're not getting, you know, the, the wash of the sediment into the stream during base flow. Uh, but still, even during base flow, the prairie streams are much less in uh, total phosphorus than uh, are the, the agricultural streams. Uh, almost, well, it means King Street, so like an order of magnitude less in uh, total phosphorus in base flow. Okay, um, and pesticides, we only, the only pesticide we were able to look at was atrazine, which is a very, very common herbicide that's used in agricultural, um, um, for agriculture, primarily for corn. Uh, so the surprising thing about this graph is since our, since the East Fork Drywood Creek is, uh, like 95% prairie, we didn't really expect to see any atrazine uh, in samples there, but we did see some low levels, but nevertheless, there was some. You can see the agricultural, uh, one of the agricultural watersheds was quite a bit higher. The standard is three micrograms per liter, which none of our medians were above that, but um, still the fact that we detected it at all at Prairie State Park, um, actually brings, what it points out is, is atrazine is actually transported through the air to, to some degree. So when it's sprayed on a field, some of it escapes into the atmosphere and is spread all over everywhere. So when it rains, some of that is knocked out uh, of the atmosphere. It uh, runs off the stream, off the surface and into the stream and we detect it at very low levels, uh, even when there was any, none used on the watershed. So. Uh, I think that's kind of the, the take home message on the, on the atrazine. Okay, so uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem like I got through this pretty fast, but we're here to the, just to summarize some of the things, some of the points that we uh, you know, came, came out with in that study. And one was we certainly have greater infiltration in our prairie watersheds, much greater infiltration. And we have a greater percentage of that uh, infiltration that gets back to the stream as, as uh, base flow, groundwater, goes through the soil and groundwater. We have prairie streams have more zero flow days, which is kind of interesting. And we think that's probably because of our prairie plants have so much, this always usually occurs between like July and October, and our prairie plants are having, are, have so much transpiration, um, evapotranspiration, and that uh, it, it does zap the base flow and the prairie streams at the time of year. Um, also, any rainfall that we get during that time of year almost never even makes it to the stream. We had uh, a seven inch rain one time that just barely made a hiccup on the stream at, at uh, East Fork Driveway. So that's why we have more zero flow. You know, I would expect that the biota that we that used to occur on zero streams on these small streams were adapted to it, uh, to surviving those zero flow periods. Uh, we have greater retention of precipitation. In other words, it's just less water that escapes the, the watershed. We had, and a lot of that is a decrease of our peak flows. We had some really drastic decreases in peak flows. So uh, another way to minimize flooding on our streams in Missouri is to have more prairie in our watershed. Um, we can maybe expect that uh, the changes 
to uh, from less flashy streams over the last eight to 10,000 years to more flashy streams. That means you're quick to rise, quick to fall, and uh, it's all coming off as runoff. That change may have uh, affected our biological assemblages and streams uh, in the last couple hundred years. Low dissolved oxygen may be a natural phenom uh, phenomenon, and at least in the Osage Prairie streams. Um, we did see a few kind of low flow periods, usually in the summer, which when temperatures are low and when stream flow is low. So that's uh, those are two things that may make our prairie streams vulnerable to low dissolved oxygen concentration. But once again, the, the biota that lived there probably were adapted to those periods. We have much lower nutrient concentrations in our prairie streams, especially during runoff. And we did detect some uh, atrazine in, uh, in our samples and probably from airborne sources. And uh, the last <laughs> bullet there was uh, basically it was a pitch to include uh, Prairie State Park uh, stream flow gauge in one of the USGS benchmark site network. But those are sites that are supposed to be pretty that uh, we monitor as to be able to try to use heads as benchmarks to compare everything else against. Uh, er basically, everything that we did in these studies is you find in two places. You see more box plots, and more constituents, and more, more data in the USGS publication on the left there. And there's the, uh, the website that you can go to to get it off online. And then you are, there was also an article we did uh, in the Prairie Journal back in uh, 2010 that uh, includes a lot of the same information without a lot of the graphics and details. <laughs> And I think that's about it. This is a picture of East Drywood Creek of Prairie State Park. And I think just the visual uh, character of it is, is very different from most strings that we have in Missouri. But I, with that, I will open it up. And if there's questions, I will try to answer them. Thank you, Dale. You did an excellent job of explaining pretty complex information. Hi everyone, I'm Carol David, Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Thanks everybody for joining us. And we do have a number of questions um, that I will ask you, Dale. Um, Robin asks, was the agricultural site data obtained over many years or over what time period was the ag stream data obtained? Yeah, well, the last year it was obtained was 2009. I think, like we'll go back up to the first slide, I believe we had 15 years of water quality data at East Fork Drywood and 20 years at Kings Creek. And we had concurrent data for the same period of time for all the other sites that we used for water quality comparisons. Thank you. Frank asks, did you evaluate turbidity? Uh, we, we do have some turbidity data. Uh, at the time that we did this study, we did not have enough at all the sites to do a comparison. Uh, Ultra sites, we didn't have turbidity data or we didn't have a whole lot at uh, some of our prairie sites. So we did not include that uh, in this. But since then, <laughs> since 2009, I'm pretty sure we've collected, they've collected, uh, I retired about then, so I can't tell you for sure, but I'm pretty sure since then they've collected quite a bit of turbidity data. So. That'd be one thing we could go back and revisit and, and come up with some pretty interesting stuff, I think. Thank you. Um, Mary Jo asks, what percent of the ag sites in those watersheds were no-till? I do not know, but I will, I will think I would be safe to guess there would be a fairly small percentage, for certainly less than half at that time when this data was collected. Yeah, that you know, that's what thirteen years ago you said, and yeah. and no-till has become a bit more a bit more common since then. But prior to that, certainly was less common. Right. Um, next question: Greg asks, did you did you do any analysis looking at glyphosate? We did not. Atrazine was the only um, only pesticide that we really uh, looked at in this study. And he also asked, does tilling of the fields affect the results? 
I mean, what, what tilling, one of the main things tilling does is it uh, provides another bigger source of sediment to the stream. And with that sediment come all kinds of other con contaminants like nutrients and, and bacteria and uh, lots of things come with that sediment. So certainly tillage has a major effect on the water quality of the stream. Thank you. Um, Val asks, how different was the geology at the two prairie areas? Very different. And that, so that provides us actually a fairly big range. Uh, the, the geology at Prairie State Park is a, mostly a sandstone prairie. Um, and it has rocks that are pretty, well, I guess the word is massive. In other words, they don't have a lot of cracks in them. They're it's pretty solid compared to the, to the layered limestone uh, that you find in the Flint Hills. Uh, the, these layers of limestone are very cracked and they're thin and they're, they do transmit water probably much more readily than than uh, Prairie State Park. So we kind of thought we had two in members of the of the geology in Prairie Stream by selecting these two. Thank you. Heidi asks, I, I wonder how much mycelium impacts the prairie versus the ag results. So my uh, mycelium uh, in the in the soil. I do not know, <laughs> but anything that provides, you know, more porosity to the soil or more permeability to the soil is going to uh, uh, certainly emphasize the, the characteristics that the prairie already has in terms of um, retaining that precipitation in the soil as opposed to letting it run off. So um, but I really don't know uh, as far as a quantity what, what that might, what effect that might have. Thank you. David asks, how long would it take before a, a restored prairie would show these results? And by restored, I, I think he probably means a, a, a landscape reconstructed with, with prairie vegetation or prairie plantings. How long would it, would it take for a prairie planting to show the same results as the original prairie? Well, if you're going from a tilled field to a, to a planting to then, you know, it takes, <laughs> It takes centuries, basically, to restore a prairie uh, to anything close to what it originally was, at least in terms of you know, plant diversity and species. Uh, but however, I think once you got your, your prairie cover step, you would see some major results right away in your, in your water quality. Um, now, you would also, you know, with time, as these roots got deeper and you got more and more soil porosity and permeability with different species of plants putting down their roots and then those roots dying and leaving uh, pores and spaces open. Uh, I think your permeability would slowly increase over time. Uh, that would probably take much longer, but I don't really have a number uh, to give you uh, to that might how fast that infiltration rate might change. Thank you, Dale. If I could just maybe add to that, um, and this gets to a, another question from Karen. We do know from work at Iowa State University on their Prairie Strips program that <clears throat> looking at just a few, I think just over a few years, planting a strip of prairie plants um, within corn and soybean crops or along the edge, they're seeing just planting 10% of that cropped area see something like 95% drop in, in uh, soil leaving that field. So I, I think that the uh, results could be fairly quick um, in terms of at least, at least the things that the Prairie Strips project measured. And we'll share a link to a webinar on Prairie Strips and an article on Prairie Strips with that information in the email that goes out tomorrow. And Karen asks, have there been, this is kind of this related, have there been studies on how different agricultural practices might have higher or lesser negative effects? It would be great to restore all the prairie, but that's just a wish. Therefore, how can agriculture improve without having to completely give up growing crops? Well, I, I, I'm not really an expert on this either, but I would say that somebody mentioned earlier, I mean, a no-till any practice that decreases the amount of sediment that leaves the field. So cover crops would certainly do that because bare 
fields in the wintertime are very prone to erosion and sediment loss. Um, uh, any of the, the strip cropping uh, methods that stop and sediment from moving down the hill, the prairie strips are a good example. Uh, things that can you know, very much can uh, help improve our stream water quality. They don't, you know, they might not see quite the results that a full prairie watershed would see, but uh, there certainly is a lot of uh, benefits that can be gained by even putting small parts of a field into prairie grasses and prairie plants. And Dale, if I could add too, there are also experiments with perennial crops that never, that don't have to be replanted. Um, there's work going on at the Land Institute in Kansas, for example, uh, experiments with things like compass plants, uh, which is a perennial prairie plant, and using that, harvesting the seeds and, and extracting oil um, for an ex as an example. So that would be another example of not disturbing the soil. And the compass plant is also the one of the most deep rooted uh, prairie plants there is, which would also help the infiltration rate and things like that over time. Um, th that relates to another qu question here on what are the typical root depths of the plants found in a prairie watershed? Well, I, I've, the deepest I've generally heard is about 15 feet, and that might be something like the compass plant. Um, and but then, just in general, uh, you know, you probably, and Carol, maybe you might have a feel for this too. Uh, five, six, seven feet is probably not too unusual. Whereas compared to uh, like fescue or some cool season grass, some, like and you were talking inches, maybe at, you know, <laughs> less than a foot. So it's, there is a big difference. I th yeah, I think you're right, Dale. And I'd also add too that the root depth can de depend on what kind of, what it's growing in. <laughs> For example, yeah. in the gl glaciated soils of Northern Missouri, um, those roots have, they don't have to get through a lot of rock. So they're, they can, in many cases, you know, fulfill their, their potential of how, right. you know, how complex and deep, whereas in the Osage Plains, which is rockier, um, might not see that same, the root growth potential realized. Um, question from uh, uh, Greg, and I, I apologize, Greg, I may have misinterpreted your question when I uh, relayed about his the question about tilling. He, he was wondering about tiling, laying oh. tile for drainage in the field. How would, how do, can you comment on effects that would have? And, and maybe for those who aren't, can you explain a little bit more what tiling is? Because some people may not be aware of it. Tiling is when you have an agricultural field that you know stays wet a lot, and so it makes it difficult to you know get in and farm, or get makes it difficult to harvest your crop in the fall because the fields are too wet. And so they go in and they basically put um, pipes or tubes a, a few feet below the surface. These type these pipes have holes in them or perforations that allow then this soil water to get in them and they have a the pipes have a slope on them and they drip so that water drains to an outlet eventually probably getting to a stream and um, there, there have been studies that have shown mostly in Iowa that these tile drains are often big sources of nitrate for streams uh, because what they do is they short circuit the system that they put on fertilizer on the field and um, Instead of you know any leftover fertilizer that the plant doesn't use, it gets carried by the water down to these tile drains and straight up to the stream. Whereas normally it might be left in the soil um, and either uh, eventually used up by plants or denitrified. That means it gets turned into nitrogen gas uh, by um, in anoxic conditions and turned return to the atmosphere, so it doesn't get down the pipe and out to the stream. But in some places, like the Platte River Valley and uh, some places on Iowa, these tile drains are major sources to the Mississippi River uh, nitrate that we see. Thank you, Dale. Uh, another question. Do you feel that the loss of aquifer levels are direct, directly attributable to the loss of the areas of different types of prairie? 
Well, I mean, aqua levels have not dropped in Missouri much, uh, except for maybe in a few isolated places. We're probably talking about out in Kansas, maybe the Ogallala or something. And those drops out there are very much due to just too much pumping. Um, the recharge rate is very low anyway out there because the rainfall rate is very low anyhow, and the evapotranspiration rate is high. So the recharge rate to the aquifer is low anyway. So when they start pumping like they do, um, that's the main cause of the decline there. Uh, prairies, I'm not sure how, if they, they do have a lot of evapotranspiration. So they may not uh, provide a whole lot more uh, recharge to aquifers than, than agriculture areas. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I don't think there's a primary driver between uh, water level decline. Thank you. Uh, Joanna asked the prairie stream photo that we're looking at now, it implies a big difference in morphology between the prairie and the ag streams. I think she means the actual stream morphology. Could you describe that a little more, particularly with regard to incision? And you might explain what, what she means by incision. Yeah, just incision just means how far, how deep the stream is in, uh, carved into the landscape or into the soil. And you're right, this picture here, uh, it's, it is not. The banks are low and is not in size very far. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here, this is a very upland stream. It's very, you know, not far. It's only a couple of miles from the divide. So it, does have, it doesn't have enough flow or a long enough time to really in size very much. Um, a lot of the Western Missouri streams of larger size are very much in size, very, it's kind of a, I have yet to kind of really figure out what the primary driver for that, but they're abnormally in size in Western Missouri. Uh, but this one here, you're right. One of the reasons too probably is that there's a lot of bedrock. Uh, this is far enough up in the stream that the you know, bottom is bouncing on bedrock from riffle to riffle. And so it hasn't been able to carve very deeply. Whereas a lot of those other streams that are bigger they are, they are incising into alluvial material, which is a loose, unconsolidated material that's easily eroded. So they're incised a little bit more. One thing, other thing is different about this one is, is it, doesn't, this, it doesn't have a lot of uh, trees or woody material along the stream bank here, although there are places that you can see some more shrubbier stuff at Troy State Park. But um, uh, that the fires that can burn all the way through uh, keep those trees down here, and that's 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 a lot different than some of the bigger streams that you'd see in the in West Central Missouri too, uh, as well as the besides the morphology. So speaking of the of the woody vegetation, Danny asks an interesting question that I had never thought of: Is there any beaver activity along prairie streams? <laughs> I guess I don't know the answer to that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that there is, um, at least on some streams, I, I think there was. I mean, I do know that the Osage made quite a living on trapping beaver, and this was their homeland. So I suspect that uh, I suspect that there were beaver. What they used for their dams, I mean, they probably had, they certainly had access to mud, and there probably there is a lot of woody vegetation you know this this picture doesn't show a lot but there is smaller shrubbier woodier vegetation around so I, I would think that they could they could do all right here uh, Joanna asks can you comment on how seasonality affects the data distribution for example ag runoff would likely be a lot higher on a spring bare soil field than a midsummer field covered in lush crops while spring is also when we get some of our most intense rainfall, whereas prairie provides year-round ground cover and soil holding. Yeah, we did see a very seasonal effect on flow on the prairie streams. I mean, like I said, we between July and October, these streams were dry most of the time. Um, the prairie streams were. And you know, that was a little bit of a shock to us. Um, but I think we had we, we have to realize that this prairie vegetation is taking a lot of water out of the soil in the summertime uh, for transpiration. And uh, so the soil is very dry and can absorb a tremendous amount of rainfall when that happens. It's also the soils 
you know, prairie soils tend to be uh, thicker than agricultural soils because uh, they've accumulated soil over the years from the decay of prairie plants. Now, some of the prairies that are left are kind of in rockier areas, so maybe their soil depths aren't as great, but uh, we certainly have a lot of room for infiltration on these prairies. Whereas, so we get a big rain on the prairie in these July to October time frames, and the stream just does never see the, see the, the runoff. Whereas on agricultural streams in the summer, there is enough, uh, low enough, yeah, low enough infiltration, low enough permeability on these agricultural fields that the water, or some of it that runs off, and actually provides water during those, that period of time to agricultural fields more often than on prairie streams. So, but there is a definite seasonal signature to both of them, but mo it's even more pronounced on prairie streams. And Dale, I think that, like you said, your study uh, kind of surprised you that uh, maybe because we've we've heard for so long that you could see a prairie stream running in, you know, in the middle of August because water was coming into the stream from base flow. Um, but your, your study really dispelled that and um, the amount of, okay. of, of water, you know, being absorbed through, through interception and then transpire certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, right. well, I will say that even still with those periods of zero flow, we had more base flow from prairie streams than we did from agricultural streams. Mm -hmm. um, it's just at that time of year, it just dried up. And there's so much, there's so much less runoff off the prairies that uh, it makes it a lot more base flow percentage wise. And you mentioned that because of these changes in, in these streams uh, converted to agricultural you know, watersheds, that um, the, the macroinvertebrate um, community is quite, quite different. So I don't think that your study compared the macroinvertebrates in, in the streams. Is that correct? No, but that certainly seems like the next thing we ought to do. <laughs> you know, now that we have uh, some information on the differences in water quality and, and the stream flow regimes, uh, now it'd be also, now the next step would be to go look at some of the biota and see then what, what differences in character we have there. Uh, I know there'd be a lot of folks that would love to do a study like that. Yeah, Bob asked a question if those data comparing uh, macroinvertebrate populations between prairie and ag streams e exist, and they they might. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, we, we did have a study comparing macroinvertebrate populations in two different prairie streams on MPF prairies, but they were both uh, prairie, and, and those weren't really, those are pretty localized watersheds just within um, two different prairies. But we'll share a link to that article in what goes out uh, tomorrow. Yeah, uh, most watersheds that are uh, all prairie are extremely small, you know, less than a less than a half a square mile because and so consequently they don't have flow too often. Uh, and that a lot of the prairies that we have left, one of the reasons is because a lot of the prairies we have left are on divides, on watershed divides. So even a a 40 acre prairie might go two or three different directions and not into the same watershed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, we, we don't, we just don't have, I mean, Prairie State Park is the largest, nearly all prairie watershed that we have. So there, there really can't be a whole lot of data on uh, the biology of uh, watersheds that size. Um, Sophie asks, what funding opportunities exist for farmers to put in prairie strips? And I am so glad she asked because <laughs> um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation actually has a, a, a three-year grant. We're in the second year of it now to help fund uh, promotion of prairie strips and also help fund establishment of prairie strips. There is a conservation, a federal conservation reserve program prairie strips practice. It's called CP43. And that helps pay for um, the establishment of prairie strips. And I can, we will send, we have a whole page on prairie strips um, on the Missouri Prairie Foundation website with that information. And we'll share that uh, tomorrow. And then even if a person enrolls in that program, the Prairie Foundation grant can help um, add to, add to, add some funding to make it even um, less, less costly. Um, I think that Dale personally just enrolled in prairie strips in the prairie strips practice yes, for just, some his land. 
Yeah, I do. I'm going to try one. Um, it's uh, along the edge of the field, and uh, I, I just went down and applied. They have to go out and check out the site. And they have to do a lot of things before I'm accepted into the program, but I'm trying to get one in. I have a I have a cousin who's had prairie strips on his farm in Iowa for 20 years, and he's very, very proud of them. <laughs> he uh, he uh, brags about them and how, how well they do. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to starting one myself. Um, James asks, after your comment on the Agalala aquifer, he's wondering if there are comparable studies from the region underlain by that aquifer or others in Kansas. Comparable studies to this one that we did? I think he means, um, yes. Yeah, so in areas where they're uh, in the Agalala aquifer region have studies like yours been conducted there, I think is what he means. Oh, um, well, I'm not aware of any. For, for one thing, that would be a much different scale than what ours. The Ogallala goes from Texas to Nebraska, I believe, maybe no farther north than that even. And uh, it's under, you know, it underlays a lot of different landscapes. Uh, so there would be, it would be a totally different scale of study. And I am not aware of any uh, that have tried to, to distinguish what, uh, what effects prairie have on the recharge versus non-prairie areas. Thank you. A, a couple of comments. Um, Jan and Don mentioned about the Danforth Foundation's work on perennial um, no-till crops. And I'm glad they mentioned that. The, I mentioned the Land Institute in Kansas um, is doing uh, work on that, but also the Danforth uh, Plant Science Center in St. Louis is working on uh, doing some similar work. So that's really promising. And uh, Stuart Miller mentions to recreate, this is in, I, I think someone had a question about how long it might take um, an area planted with prairie vegetation to perform uh, or, or, or yield the same kind of water quality and hydrological results as the intact original prairie. And Stuart says, to, who's a soil scientist says to recreate similar soil infiltration, soil percolation and water storage characteristics of native prairie soils would take centuries. But as Dale indicates, there can be significant improvements as demonstrated by the 30 year old CRP native grass plantings and similar aged reconstructions. Now Stuart should know because he has converted uh, very acid mine spoils to prairie grasses <laughs> on a pretty large scale. So he should know. Um, John says it would be good to have a plant inventory from this photograph that's on the screen to use for plant selection and bioretentions and rain gardens. Does Prairie State Park or someone have a list or do I need to go there and see it? Well, I would say yes, you should always go to Prairie State Park and other prairies <laughs> if you can, but that's a really good question. And I imagine that Prairie State Park would have a plant list. Um, I can also ask colleagues with the Missouri Department of Conservation for prairie swale plant lists. So when prairie ecologists and botanists are um, in, or, or in any area, not just prairie, they um, will often use pre-typed pre out standard lists of species that you would expect to find in say a prairie swale or a you know, a dry chert woodland or what have you. And then they can just use that as a checklist as they're looking to see what's there. So I can inquire about that and um, see if there's a prairie swale plant list that we can provide. That's a good question. Yeah, I just looking at this picture, it looks to me like one of the main features in it is some prairie cord grass, but um, right there on the bank. Um, oh, and, and uh, we're seeing some people, uh, uh, James is identifying some plants there for us. Uh, prairie, prairie cordgrass, um, uh, button bush, uh, indigo bush, carrick species. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of, of funding, other funding, the um, Jeannie is pointing out the soil and water conservation districts in each county. Um, do you also have state cost share for um, soil erosion prevention practices and it's money that that uh, is that we pay through the 
parks, soils, and water conservation sales tax that we pay that helps fund our state parks and also uh, a lot of those um, state-based uh, soil and water conservation practices. Um, but again, the, the prairie strips practice per se is a federal um, a federal cost share practice. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think a lot of that money goes to the soil and water conservation dist districts in each county. Yes. And I'm not sure how, you know, how they distribute that money and what kind of programs. I have not participated in any of those. So um, I'm not really aware of those. Yeah, I'm not very well versed in them either. But um, yes, going to those soil and water, there's a soil and water conservation district in each county, I believe. And uh, you can learn more there. I think there are other practices like fencing, um, maybe livestock out of streams, or uh, that, that might be another you know, practice. Um, yeah, Jeannie comments, there's $45 million a year. And so, um, and uh, the, there's no other questions except Treva says, hi, Dale, how is retirement? Oh, Jeff Imes asks, oh. hi, Dale, how's retirement? <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Man, I, I haven't talked to him in a long time. Well, I'll just comment from how active um, Dale is with the Missouri Prairie Foundation that I don't know how he had time for a job before because he does so much volunteering and excellent work for the Prairie Foundation. Um, we're so grateful to him and all of our other board members and volunteers. And of course, as you can see, um, Dale is such a great resource with all of his expertise on this very important topic. Um, with that, there's no more questions. Did you have any other comments that you'd like to share, Dale? No, just thank you for the chance to be able to, to share information about Prairie Streams. Thank you so much, Dale. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We will have another uh, wonderful webinar, a Grow Native webinar on introduction to butterflies on March 2nd with um, Betsy Betros, who wrote the photographic guide to Butterflies of the Kansas City region. She's an excellent photographer and a seasoned presenter. She, even though it's an intro, I think we will all learn a lot no matter what your level is. She's going to go over um, different groups of butterflies, their morphology, habitat needs, host plant needs. Then two weeks later on March 16th, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Mike Stambaugh on um, fire history looking at dendrochronology at, at, at tree rings to look um, at how fire scars and, and, and uh, how that gives us information on fire history along the prairie woodland um, borders. So do, do uh, tune in, register for those, and we'll have that registration open on our website here soon. And um, thank you so much for tuning in and uh, we'll get an email out with a link to the recording to you tomorrow. So everyone have a good night. And if you're in the low in Missouri, watch out for the weather tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks again, Dale. Thank you.